This is the present date right here, and we go backwards in time as we go here to 160,000 years ago. This is the carbon dioxide level, and you can see it is varied, fairly high, and then it goes down, and then it peaks up again. This is glaciation and the end of the glacial periods and ice ages coming and going and such. And um, take a look at the scale over here. This is CO2 parts per million, 200, 250, 300. So this translates, this 200 parts per million translates to 0.02% of the atmosphere, parts per million. Now remember this graph and note that never in the last 160,000 years, the very top of this graph is 300 parts per million. Never has the carbon dioxide gone above 300 parts per million. Remember that. So that Vostok data never went above 300 parts per million in the last 160,000 years. Here is modern direct measurements of carbon dioxide. This is the famous Keeling graph, direct measurements of carbon dioxide from Mauna Loa in Hawaii since about the mid-1950s. And I'm sure you've seen this before from 1960 up to about 2000. The present is now up here, and you can see it goes up and down the seasonal variation, but the overall trend is quite definitely up. So here is the 310 parts per million. The Vostok data looked like it was all over the place, but the graph didn't start at zero, so actually differences were exaggerated. On a large time scale, the carbon dioxide goes up. On a small time scale, up and down. On a small time scale, the carbon dioxide has been fairly level for thousands of years. But on this time scale, the human time scale, it's going up perceptibly. And notice, when I first started looking at this stuff, the number was in the 350 parts per million. So 350 parts per million is the same thing as 0.035%. And remember now I said the atmospheric comp uh, composition percentage of carbon dioxide is 0.4%. That's because it's now around 380 parts per million. That's up here, which rounds up to 0.04%. Now, Gore did this graph in the previous graph much better than I did, but a lot of people, he's a very divisive character, so a lot of people um, won't take it from him, but you don't know me yet, so maybe I'm not as divisive. I can't do it as well as him, but the message here is pretty clear. Carbon dioxide levels are changing perceptibly, and they are higher now than they have been in the last 160,000 years. So. The objection that we're not the ones doing it, that it's a natural variation, yes, there is natural variation in carbon dioxide levels and in climate. But the signal that we get from this clearly is outside of the norm for the last 160,000 years. So to say that it's a natural variation, there is natural variation, but that doesn't mean that any variation is natural. There is strong, direct, credible evidence that we are putting significant enough amounts of carbon dioxide into the air to alter the Earth's climate. That part actually is not disputed by any credible scientific body, organization, or person. Science is as certain as science can get that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases trap the sun's radiation on the earth, and atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide are rising as a result of human activity. So if you go back to that picture with us pulling carbon out of the ground, combining with oxygen in our cars and puking it out the top, the burden of proof really is on the skeptics to say, how can we do that to the tune of 7 billion tons of carbon a year and not alter the climate? We know it's a greenhouse gas. We know we're taking it out of the ground in significant amounts. We know that its concentration in the atmosphere is rising. So really the burden of proof is how would that not have an impact on climate? But really, who am I to judge? Who are you to judge? Are you a climatologist? I'm not. Would you take my word for it if I was a climatologist? So I'm showing you scientific data, but really, let's just leave the science to the scientists. We do our job of supervising them. They have PhDs for a reason. But as long as we're talking about this stuff, we got these pictures, we can use them to see why a couple misconceptions, a couple objections can, uh, can be dismissed fairly. You can see why it's reasonable that they are dismissed by the scientists who look at them. One of those objections is, isn't it controversial, this whole greenhouse gas thing? And no, it's not at all controversial. We just showed, or I just uh, mentioned how the burden of proof really is on the skeptics, that we can emit all of this known greenhouse gas and not have an effect on the climate. Another objection is that that Vostok graph was all over the place. So what we're seeing now, the warming in the latter half of the 20th century is natural variation. And we've seen from the Keeling graph that we're significantly altering the composition of our, of our atmosphere. Another objection that I've actually heard several times is, what if we take action and climate change doesn't happen 
How would we know whether it was ever true in the first place? Well, what we know is pretty much summed up in the models, which make testable predictions about the climate. And the bad news is, according to the models, it's prob most of the models, it's probably too late for us to avoid some significant changes. So from what we've done already, we are probably in for some significant changes. We can still have an effect on the magnitude and speed of those changes. What that does for that objection, though, is that we can go ahead, if we do act, and things turn out fine and dandy with no change, then we know that the models were wrong. And if we get data and that matches the models, then we don't know the models were right. So it's really kind of a silly objection to say, well, we shouldn't act because if climate change turns out to not happen, how do we know if that was because that our acting was effective or because climate change was actually um, a conspiracy or a bunch of bunk? So another objection that we can um, sort of dismiss by taking a look at this is uh, how arrogant we are to think that we can affect the globe. We are too small to have any effect on the climate. Too small to have any effect? Tell that to a virus or a mosquito in your bedroom as you're trying to go to sleep. The Keeling graph is hard scientific data. We are significantly altering the composition of our atmosphere. And too small? Well, it's enough, because remember, 99.9% .9 of the atmosphere is already not greenhouse gases. That leaves just 0.1% for greenhouse gases and everything else, of which carbon dioxide is a small part. But if you do a small part of a small part, and someone gives you the calculation, it's going to look tiny. You'll look at it and say, pfft. It's nothing. How could we possibly have any effect? Well, greenhouse gases already are small and powerful. That Keeling graph combined with the Vostok graph shows you that the amount of carbon dioxide we are emitting is significant. And uh, here's one that I often hear. If we talk about going to alternative energies and say instead of pulling up carbon out of the ground, which we're going to have to do anyway because I think you've seen that this stuff is finite. We, we, will, we will run out of it probably in our lifetimes, even if we don't worry about climate change. It simply is not being made at the rate that we are taking it out. So if we stop taking this carbon out of the ground and turning it into carbon dioxide, and instead one alternative is to take water, split water from the ocean into, to split the H2O into H2, hydrogen, and burn it in our cars, combining with oxygen from the atmosphere, that recombines back into water. And your hydrogen fuel cell car emits water vapor, which is a relatively powerful greenhouse gas. So the critique is, well, wouldn't we, we, wouldn't we just be replacing one greenhouse gas with another? Hydrogen fuel cell cars aren't that cool. Well, take a look at where the carbon and where the hydrogen came from. Where, did this, where was this molecule, this water molecule, two years before it came out of the tailpipe of this car? It was already in the hydrosphere. It was already here. Where was this carbon dioxide molecule? Well, for the last 300 million years, it's been buried underneath the, the ground. The carbon has, at least. The oxygen has been floating around somewhere else. So it's... Um, really not valid to say we're just swapping one greenhouse gas for another. It's true, they're both molecules of greenhouse gas. This one, though, has been hidden away for 300 million years. This one, though, has been hidden away for about three months. And now that you understand the mechanics, you're ready for some more bad news. Remember that seven gigatons per year of carbon, dioxide, of carbon that we put out? How two of it goes into the oceans, three of it stays in the atmosphere, and two of it goes we don't know where? That's a funny two. Well, in the short run, this is a good thing. This is a carbon sink, and what it does is it keeps that carbon out of the air. But the problem is, we don't know how long it's going to keep doing that. And this is what's called a masking effect, because the fact that the ocean is absorbing this two gigatons per year is masking the effect that we would normally see from that two gigatons being, per year being in the air. So the same thing with this unknown sponge, the unknown, the mysterious carbon sink, the missing carbon sink. We don't know how long that's going to keep sucking up the carbon for us and keeping it out of the air, keeping it from doing its greenhouse thing up in the atmosphere. So um, part of that is where the scare tactics comes from in the next video, scare tactics, which uh, you're set up now to understand a little bit of, get a flavor of um, where some of the really frightening dynamics may come from in terms of abrupt climate change. So be sure to check that out, but don't just stop there and flop over in despair. Go on after that to the solutions video because there is probably still time to do something about this. We just gotta be quick about it. So I'll see you there.